Good evening, everyone. Uh, just give me a thumbs up if you could hear me well and if you could see uh, my screen and my slides. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Refit Center for uh, this invitation. It is still in the spirit of where Red Canada and women's heart health. And uh, for that reason, uh, I chose a topic that uh, is very applicable to women. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to um, talk to uh, you regarding SCAD and um, living with SCAD. Uh, some of the questions that have come up uh, through the years in the clinic and through working with SCAD patients, I'm hoping to answer and we'll have about uh, 15, 20 minutes at the end for discussion and uh, questions and answers. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is that uh, the, the most important thing about uh, women and myocardial infarction is the fact that uh, they need to uh, be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of heart attack. And over the past few years, we've been working very hard with uh, Heart and Stroke Foundation and other organizations to raise awareness of the typical symptoms of heart attack that could occur in women that may be a bit different than what men usually experience. I'd like to reemphasize that the most common presentation continues to be chest pain, but there could be associated symptoms, uh, including pain and discomfort in the arms, back, the jaw, between the shoulder blades and the stomach. Often patients present with shortness of breath in association with the chest discomfort, but the initial presentation uh, may be uh, only shortness of breath. We know that myocardial infarction could be caused by buildup of atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries, but in uh, women, uh, myocardial infarction could be caused by spontaneous coronary artery dissection. This is a condition that is not associated with atherosclerosis or uh, cholesterol buildup, but is uh, related to splitting of the layers of the arteries. And I'm gonna show you a video to show you the distinguishing between the atherosclerosis and SCAD. We know that SCAD uh, is uh, more common in women that are aged less than 50 years old. And if we suspect myocardial infarction, the diagnosis of SCAD is made with coronary angiogram. This video is a simple cartoon uh, demonstrating the rupture of a cholesterol plaque, which leads to activation of platelets and clot formation in the coronary artery. Traditionally, this is how heart attack uh, occurs in patients who have cholesterol buildup in their arteries. In SCAD, the mechanism is a bit different. A tear develops on the inside of the coronary artery, allowing blood to create a slit between two layers of the wall. This may result in a loose flap of tissue on the inside of the artery. Sometimes the slit remains small, but the blood in between the layers can clot. This clot, called an intramural hematoma, may cause the normal artery channel to become narrow, blocking blood flow to the heart. Myocardial infarction caused by SCAD uh, is usually related to the type of uh, splitting of the artery that I showed in this cartoon. And I know that, um, just one second here. My screen disappeared. Uh, just give me a second and I'm gonna share again. Sorry about that. Uh, what happens is uh, the um, artery uh, splits up and as it splits, the layers of the artery uh, start to uh, block off the flow through uh, the true lumen of the artery. And by the formation of this buildup of intramural hematoma, uh, the artery could completely block off and stop flow to the uh, muscle of the heart. Here in this um, uh, cartoon, again, I am trying to show uh, visible clot formation in the lumen of the artery that could completely block off the flow to the heart muscle and cause myocardial infarction. We know that there are different types of myocardial infarction that SCAD could cause. And the initial diagnosis is based on the symptoms of the patient. So it is very important if you suspect that you're having myocardial infarction based on chest pain or uh, <clears throat> any other symptoms, 
that um, I have uh, discussed with you earlier to try to call 911 or go to the nearest emergency room so you could obtain an electrocardiogram. Electrocardiogram is usually the first method by which we could make the diagnosis of myocardial infarction. As you could see here, there are different electrocardiographic appearances of uh, infarction that have different severity. And this is terminology that we use uh, to describe uh, the severity of blockage of the artery from partial blockage to complete blockage with clot to um, overall um, complete lack of blood supply to all the areas of the heart that could reproduce cardiogenic shock or even abnormal heartbeat that could present with sudden cardiac death, the patient collapses and loses consciousness. So it is very important that if any of the symptoms occur, we need to ask for emergency help and call an ambulance so we could obtain images of ECGs immediately. Once the patient is diagnosed with acute myocardial infarction, we usually bring them to the cardiac catheterization lab where we perform an urgent angiogram, which could happen usually 24-7 uh, around the clock. Uh, and we could make the diagnosis of myocardial infarction and see if there is a club or spontaneous coronary artery dissection in the arteries. Traditionally, if there is a clot in the artery or atherosclerosis, we uh, balloon the blockage and position a stent in the artery to keep the artery and the flow open. On other occasions, uh, for example, with SCAD, sometimes we may not need to put a stent, but just leave the artery heal spontaneously, which we will discuss later on. These are results of uh, the first uh, big cohort that was uh, presented uh, predominantly from Canadian women. It's called the CAN-SCAD registry, and maybe some of the people that are online today are participants in this uh, cohort. And it just demonstrates that if a patient is diagnosed with SCAD, most of the times they present with acute myocardial infarction. It is unusual SCAD to be diagnosed in a stable condition without chest pain or uh, troponin elevation. As you could see here in the slide, 91.5% of patients in this registry had chest pain, but some of them had back discomfort or shoulder discomfort. And again, the vast majority of the patients presented with acute myocardial infarction, not with stable symptoms over many days. Most of the patients' diagnosis is made on the basis of ECG, like I showed, or an angiogram, but also a um, biomarker that we obtained from their blood on arrival to the hospital called troponin. So it is very important that this uh, blood test is done upon arrival at the hospital. And most, as you could see here, 98% of patients in this cohort had elevated troponins, <clears throat> meaning that this makes the diagnosis. Other things that are important to know is that uh, patients often present with uh, normal heart rhythm and normal ECGs but also a variety of changes on the ECGs, which again emphasizes the importance of obtaining ECG early in the presentation. Other things that are important is history taking, and that's why we take uh, time to educate the public and patients in uh, their presentations to emphasize specific symptoms, but also pay attention to certain things that might have contributed or brought on the symptoms. For example, often emotional triggers or stressful situations could trigger SCAD. Physical triggers like heavy resistance training, heavy lifting, or valsalva maneuvers could also provoke the condition. We know that pregnancy and peripartum state is highly associated. So if a pregnant woman complains of chest pain, this should not be ignored and an electrocardiogram should be obtained fairly early in the course of the chest pain symptoms. Hormonal triggers like perimenopausal state, uh, external hormones, and sometimes um, oral contraceptive therapy or uh, other external hormonal therapies may provoke SCAD. We know that there are some genetic conditions that are associated with softening of the arteries in other vascular beds like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or Louis Dietz syndrome that may be also predisposition to SCAD 
And the one and most commonly talked about is fibromuscular dysplasia. It's a condition uh, which is associated with softening and beating in the arteries of the body uh, or the brain that could be associated with the spontaneous coronary artery dissection. This is an example of a patient who presented with a SCAD. She was a young woman, 49 years old. She had no cardiac risk factors and no previous diagnosis of any sort. She was uh, lifting heavy and experienced sudden onset chest pain that was lingering. Uh, and for that reason, she called an ambulance. Upon arrival, the ambulance obtained an electrocardiogram, which suggested acute myocardial infarction. This triggered an alarm that brought her immediately to the cardiac catheterization lab. In the lab, we had obtained an angiogram, which is the main method of making the diagnosis of SCAD. And what we saw on the angiogram is that two of the blood vessels were affected by SCAD. One at the front of the heart, as you could see here, the LED artery, which appears uh, interrupted in this segment, but, not, uh, but the flow is not completely stopped. And the second is the spidery looking artery here, which appears completely gone. This artery was responsible for the current myocardial infarction, and that was treated with um, an actual ballooning and stenting, whereas this artery at the front was left to heal spontaneously. The patient is now five years after the event and continues to do well and participate in the cardiac rehabilitation program and hasn't had recurrent events. Uh, the importance of electrocardiogram uh, is a very important reason why I would like to discuss this with you today. So if you know people that uh, have um, any risk factors, whether they are in the age of SCAD patients or have any other cardiac risk factors, recognition of symptoms and early um, call for help is very important. The main problems occur after the diagnosis of SCAD because often uh, what we know about SCAD is based on what we call retrospective analysis. In other words, uh, the only knowledge we have is based on historical evidence of our patients, based on looking back and trying to learn from our previous experiences with SCAD patients. We know that SCAD patients often experience chest pain after their um, initial myocardial infarction, and this could go on for many months. This creates a lot of anxiety, and often we ask ourselves, why does that occur? Do we need to do another angiogram to reassess whether the artery is healed or not? Uh, we also know that the torn artery could be uh, damaged uh, to a point that the microscopic vessels that are connected to it may not be functioning properly, something called microvascular dysfunction, and that could be associated with chest pain for many months after the original heart attack. We also know that uh, sometimes uh, the SCAD itself may not heal. And in that situation, we uh, may have to do special stress testing or ischemia testing to see if the patient requires to go back for another angiogram. Patients often ask what is the risk of uh, having another event and how to prevent another episode of SCAD. From what we know from the registry, uh, specifically in Canada, the uh, death rate at three years, which is a longitudinal follow-up in this registry, is 1.2%. The myocardial infarction over that period of time was 16.8%, and recurrent SCAD events were 10.4%. This compared to other um, uh, registries are um, in about 30% in the oldest registry, which is from the Mayo Clinic. Other things that I would like to emphasize is that, um, again, I lost my screen here. I'm sorry about that. It's uh, my computer is doing this today. Just give me a second here. That's okay. <laughs> um, We'll get can it figured you, can out. you see me or not? Not your screen, no. No, hang on a sec. But it came back from the first time, so. Can you see it now? Um, no, it's still dark on my end. All right, so let's try this again. Uh, share screen. 
There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So what I wanted to say here is that the recurrence CAD events in the Canadian registry uh, for in a follow up of three years is 10%. Uh, overall, uh, the events are fairly low in this uh, uh, cohort and it's very reassuring for all the patients, at least in, in Canada, that uh, they should not be panicking about worrying about having a SCAD a year or two after their uh, original event. Uh, factors associated with uh, SCAT are hypertension. So if we have poorly controlled blood pressure, the patients usually um, are at risk of developing recurrent SCAD. We also know that certain medications prevent future events like beta blockers and aspirin. And this is something that uh, often comes up as a question. Here are the standard therapies and tests that patients obtain after their original myocardial infarction and uh, uh, discharge from the hospital. And some of you probably are familiar with them. Beta blockers, and these are some of the names of the medications. So beta blocker is the one medication that the SCAD patients will require to have for the rest of their life. And it's proven now to reduce future events. Dual antiplatelet therapy is a combination of two blood thinners. One is the baby aspirin and the other one is either clopidogrel or ticagrelor. And we usually give this to patients after uh, original heart attack for 12 months after the heart attack, if they could tolerate it. In some patients though, due to bleeding or uh, excessive bruising, we may be pushed to stop on, uh, the clopidogrel or ticagrelor earlier than 12 months. But we also know that the SCAD patients should continue the aspirin for the rest of their lives. If there is damage to the heart muscle to a point that the function of the heart is reduced, we recommend ACE inhibitors. And these are some of the names that you could see here, like ranipril or perindopril. And also, we are very strict about medications for blood pressure control uh, with a target uh, you'll see later around 130 over 80 for these patients. So we may add additional medications to control the high blood pressure. Some patients who have residual chest pain, uh, despite proper healing of the artery, may require specific medications for angina like nitroglycerin spray or patch or uh, medications like lenalazine or calcium channel blockers. Even though it's rare, sometimes the damage to the heart muscle could cause formation of aneurysms in the heart for which a clot may form inside the heart. And for these uh, rare occasions, patients may need to be put on stronger blood thinners like warfarin. As far as the tests after the discharge from the hospital, we perform CT scans or MRIs of the brain, neck, chest, abdominal, and pelvic arteries to establish if there are any changes related to fibromuscular dysplasia or aneurysms uh, similar to uh, what I described earlier. And if there are, uh, to what extent these changes are. This is a routine protocol that we do for most of our patients, and it's not necessary to be at a certain time frame because these are just screening tests for a chronic condition. Cardiac MRI or echocardiogram are uh, tests that we order routinely, and we usually do that in about three to six months after the original heart attack, and then uh, after one year to see if there are Sometimes if we're wondering whether the uh, SCAD artery has healed and completely repaired itself, we may uh, order a CT scan of the coronary arteries to check for that, or a stress test with a treadmill, a NIBI scan or an echocardiogram to assess for proper healing of the SCAD artery. The strategies to prevent recurrent SCAD events include, as I already mentioned, uh, the use of beta blockers to reduce the stress on the arterial wall, optimal uh, blood pressure control, and reduction of potential risk factors like emotional stress uh, or physical stress. And we will talk a little bit about the recommendations to what is appropriate exercise activity in these patients. What well, we uh, usually recommend is psychosocial support, mindfulness, or other type techniques where uh, breathing and um, uh, meditation help uh, these patients uh, come back to uh, um, normal balance of uh, life and acceptance of the diagnosis. And we found that peer support groups are extremely helpful in um, 
help the patients uh, to overcome the fear or uh, the um, sense of loss, um, but especially when they have myocardial infarction at such a young age. Physical activity is something that a lot of uh, patients post MI, but specifically the young SCAD patients uh, are very concerned about because often the physical activity is what provoked the SCAD. So they're very stressed and scared to come back to the gym and start performing usual exercise activities. So it is very important uh, that we encourage the attendance to the cardiac rehabilitation program. And I think that ReFit and Wellness have been doing a really good job, but specifically ReFit, who uh, had become the home of the SCAD support group and has been giving us the opportunity to collaborate uh, with uh, the local um, team of uh, how to establish optimal uh, therapies and programs for these patients. As we know, SCAD patients are not traditional post-MI patients, so uh, often uh, the routine or traditional uh, techniques or knowledge do not apply to them. Uh, overall, I would recommend uh, that uh, most of the discussions come up uh, with the cardiac rehab team. Other things that need to be avoided are uh, Valsalva type activities, so uh, very uh, heavy lifting with bearing down, uh, and also the use of sympathomimetic uh, drugs. This includes um, some of the anti-cough or anti-cold medications, but also uh, some recreational drugs like cocaine. Hormonal therapies, whether for um, Treatments or um, for uh, co contraception should be avoided as well, and future pregnancy should be very carefully planned. The cardiac rehabilitation has been a big, big unknown and a big question for many years. And I have to tell you that up until now, we don't have very good series or very uh, big bulk of knowledge about what to do with SCAD patients. There's only two papers that are published to date in the literature. One is coming from the um, Vancouver General Hospital Group, and uh, it involved only 56 patients in the early stages of this program. And what it did was uh, try to uh, select a fairly conservative protocol uh, to exercise patients post-SCAD who had myocardial infarction. Most of the patients in the program were female, and uh, the program included an entry test uh, and then an exercise prescription based on the entry test. The test was uh, performed about four to six weeks after the original event. And the target exercise heart rate was uh, established to be 50 to 70% of the heart rate reserve based on the entrance test, so fairly conservative. This was um, a program that included once a week participation for six months uh, for the participants and also incorporated resistance training, uh, which uh, included uh, light weights uh, with multiple repetitions um, and the weights were between two and 12 pounds based on the tolerance of the patient. The recommendation for women in general is to not lift more than 20 pounds, although in some of the papers that were quoted previously, uh, the recommendation for women could be 30 pounds. But in this particular paper and the program, they took a very conservative approach. That's why they chose the 20 pounds weight. And for men was uh, not lifting more than 50 pounds at one time. And the exercise systolic blood pressure was supposed to be less than 130 millimeters mercury. They also incorporated mindfulness and psychological counseling, peer support group for SCAD patients, and heart healthy cooking classes, as well as lifestyle modification. For the patients that had residual symptoms or residual problems with high blood pressure or other cardiac symptoms, they had a cardiologist on site that was helping with the management of these problems and titration of medications. The other paper that talks about recommendations is the uh, AHA scientific statement, uh, which is the guidelines uh, for the American Heart Association. And this one incorporates the study they uh, already mentioned earlier from the Vancouver General Hospital program. 
So they concluded that symptom-limited physical activity is the hallmark of any cardiac rehabilitation postcard. So if the patients continue to experience symptoms, they should not push through them, but rather uh, limit their activity to a level where they could uh, slowly and gradually build up to a point that they could tolerate the activity. To avoid prolonged high-intensity activities, to avoid highly competitive or contact sports or activities that uh, are performed to exhaustion. So something like boot camps or races are strongly um, discouraged in this type of population post-CAD. Patients post-CAD should avoid abrupt increases in physical activity without a warm-up. Uh, and um, some people discuss interval training as well as something that needs to be apply judiciously to avoid uh, exercise in extremes of temperature. So uh, hot yoga or, or cold weather or terrains should be avoided and to avoid uh, performance of Valsava maneuvers. Again, these recommendations are based on observational studies. And uh, as I said, a very small cohort of 56 patients in Vancouver uh, and uh, um, randomized trials or more data is necessary to come up with uh, more uh, strict and more confident recommendations as far as uh, cardiac rehabilitation. In summary, SCAD uh, in hospital and three-year event rates are relatively low. So this is very important. Don't live in fear if you were diagnosed with SCAD that there is an overall uh, very good prognosis um, once you've had the diagnosis and you've been put on the right medications. If you are to undergo a stenting procedure, there is variability of uh, the results. And this is also based on experience and the type of center where the diagnosis is made. Overall, conservative therapy is the choice of treatment once the diagnosis is made rather than stenting. And uh, when we look at uh, the populations of SCAT patients that were left for natural uh, healing without stenting. Uh, the overall natural healing at 30 days is 95% of patients, and at six months, 100% of them heal. Of course, if there is an indication for stenting, stents are life-saving, and uh, they should be performed by experienced operators. Recurrent scab has been reported in up to 30% in some of the cases, specifically from the Mayo Clinic, and uh, as I showed you in the Canadian cohort, is up to 10% at three years. Recurrent scab is accounting for the majority of recurrent myocardial infarctions in patients who had initial scab, and uh, it is about 4.8% uh, at three years, so really fairly low rates compared to atherosclerotic uh, patients. Recurrent uh, SCAD in another artery that was not affected during the first event is 2.8%. So you could have SCAD in multiple territories and the second event may not be in the same area where you had the initial SCAD. For that reason, regular cardiology follow-up is important uh, in the management and reduction in events. Um, I will conclude here and I will just pose some of the questions that I have had through the years from my patients and questions like to stent or not to stent is based on the expertise and the presentation of the patient. And of course, uh, stenting uh, sometimes saves lives. So if we are to stent is because we wanna open the flow to a certain area of the heart and reduce the damage to the heart muscle. Repeat angiograms um, could be risky. So sometimes non-invasive look with uh, CT scans or MIBIs are preferred. So we don't provoke the arteries or cause damage when we go back to do another angiogram. I think I already answered the question about how to prevent recurrent events. The optimal medical therapy, uh, as I said, aspirin and beta blocker have been proven to be uh, preventative for life. So if the patient could tolerate it, we recommend this uh, on the long run. And how often is the follow-up with a cardiologist? Usually in the first year, we do um, very frequent visits uh, after the event. Uh, we recommend in four to six weeks uh, an entrance uh, exercise treadmill test. Again, with COVID, things have been delayed and then follow-ups every three months in the first year. And then once the patient is stable, once a year is sufficient. 
And what to do with recurrent chest pains? Is it another MI or is it healing? And how long it takes to heal? Uh, usually it takes about six months to heal, but in some cases it may take up to a year. And chest pains can vary, and sometimes if they feel similar to the prior heart attack, we recommend that the patients obtain an emergency ECG to make sure that this is not a recurrent scab. And with this, I will conclude and just ask uh, for questions, but also would like to remind everyone that to reduce the risk of um, death from SCAD and risk from death from MI, 911 is the fastest and the most efficient way to get attention and proper treatment. And uh, I just wanted to let you know that at St. Boniface Hospital, there is established SCAD clinic where um, physicians who have experience with SCAD see all the diagnosis of SCAD in the province. It's been me for the last few years and also Dr. Minhas. Um, and now we have additional colleague, Dr. Shangbo Liu, who is joining. And also some uh, resources here with uh, websites and uh, recommendations from heart and stroke that I thought you might find helpful. And with this, I will conclude and uh, open for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Tleva. I, uh, I will admit I did have questions, but the questions you provided at the end answered the ones that I had. So you were, were two steps ahead of me. So my questions were answered. If anybody else has a question, again, just use the chat box on the bottom and type in your question and we will try and answer them in order. Um, and we'll see. I do maybe one question. You said St. Boniface has a SCAD uh, team. Is there further training that maybe the EMS has had to recognize some of these signs and symptoms? Because it typically presents in maybe a younger female. So do they have a different approach when they get that call and they can relay information to you sooner or does it not really impact? Uh, over the past three years, we've been doing the Wear Red events, uh, which are raising awareness um, through TV interviews and, and heart and stroke. And uh, uh, this year we had a virtual event and we had uh, a senior paramedic actually being part of us, part of our panel. So there has been a lot of emphasis on the primary care providers to recognize the symptoms. And, and I think it's become, um, much better than, than what it was. Again, very little is known for SCAD, and especially in, in, in smaller places, there could be still hesitancy. And that's why uh, we emphasize that patients are advocates for themselves. So they have to uh, insist for ECGs, they have to insist for blood tests and, and make sure that uh, they know what the <coughs> symptoms of, uh, of heart attack are. So that's why I think that uh, overall education on all frontiers is very important. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and speaking to this uh, fine audience um, of uh, patients and providers, as I could see here. Uh, I'm very happy to see some names that uh, work with the patients directly and help at the refit and, and some patient volunteers as well. Uh, so I appreciate all the efforts, uh, especially the patient volunteers and the, um, and the peer support groups and the fact that the refit is a home for, for one of those for SCAD. It is fantastic. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate uh, all the awareness and we are a part of the Red Take Wear Red events. We try and be a part of those uh, every year. They're a great cause. Just again, just letting anybody else have any time if you want a question. I know we've had, uh, like I mentioned, a lot of them are, were um, answered. So there's one question here. It says, my EKG didn't show my SCAD. It was the blood work. Um, oh, it just disappeared, hang on. Uh, will paramedics take a serious look? Oh, and things are moving on me as I'm reading. <laughs> At, and if you call with slight symptoms, hang on. Like, question keeps moving. Maybe you can see it. It keeps jumping on me. There we go. Uh, I only experienced pain in my arms and a general feeling of malad. 
Yeah, so the, uh, the blood tests are the first thing that happens when the patient presents to uh, the emergency room. That's why I specifically showed you the findings of the study that 97% of patients have elevated troponin. So this test is crucial for making the diagnosis of heart attack, whether it's from SCAD or from um, clot formation from atherosclerosis. So Yes, uh, paramedics are very well educated. Uh, we have um, a very good system. It's called the code STEMI system. So patients call with symptoms and on the list of symptoms, shortness of breath now with COVID has been a bit uh, more tricky, but I, I was one of the STEMI call doctors. So what happens is the paramedics come to the house and if there is shortness of breath or chest pain, they do an ECG and then they immediately uh, send it to an on-call cardiologist that reads the ECG with them. So if there are any alarming signs in the history or the ECG, the cardiologist on call would direct the paramedics to what to do with the patient. So it's not just a one-sided decision. It's actually a teamwork and it uh, has reduced the mortality from myocardial infarction in the province dramatically over the past 10 years based on this. So don't be afraid to call 911 uh, because they, they save lives. They will bring you straight to the cath lab for an angiogram if you're having a myocardial infarction. Absolutely. This one may be best for a dietitian who we have talking on Thursday, but uh, one of the questions was, is there a diet that you would suggest for SCAD patients? Uh, the SCAD patient is no different than any uh, patient that is looking for overall heart health. So uh, usually the recommendations are for balanced diet, Mediterranean type of diet, uh, which is, uh, there is nothing specific that we know about SCAD that uh, is different than just the overall general recommendations for healthy heart diet. Okay. There's a question here saying, um, I coded in the elevator after going for a CT scan. Would the dye used could have aggregate, aggravated the SCAD to cause me to code as this was my second SCAD and I never coded seven years ago. The second SCAD was seven years after my first one, but in a different vessel. Yeah, it is difficult to know if the code was because of allergic reaction or because of the uh, area of the heart that was affected by the SCAD. As I showed you the ECGs, there is a proportion of SCAD. It's not a very big one, but uh, it could cause a sudden cardiac death or code blue or code as what we call that um, in our uh, slang. Uh, and so it's hard to know if the dye had caused allergic reaction or whether this was just a bigger artery and a bigger heart attack that caused the collapse uh, and uh, the code blue. And is there, I guess, a relation between having or having had a SCAD and causing future arrhythmia issues? Uh, in general, we know if uh, we've sustained a substantial area of myocardial infarction over time, we may develop a scar tissue in the area of the myocardial infarction. And this area could become a source of what we call short circuits or ventricular tachycardias. For that reason, we always uh, keep an eye on our patients. I often uh, order an MRI at least a year after the event to see the extent of scar tissue the, uh, from the heart attack. But this is not sufficient to predict future events. Usually, um, if the event happens uh, due to that type of scar tissue or short circuit, patients require um, a defibrillator pacemaker implanted, but that's something that uh, is only as what we call secondary prevention. In other words, after the event, we don't do that preemptively uh, on the basis of the size of the heart attack or the area of the heart attack. So you mentioned um, that there isn't a lot of research. Is there, are there more studies in the works that will hopefully present some bigger findings or different research in five years, 10 years? Is that, is that what the plan is? Yes, that's, that's what the plan is. So, so St. Boniface is part of this registry that I showed you, uh, and we continue to follow our patients and recruit new patients for it. Uh, as part of this, there has been some genetic testing recently with uh, just scraping of the inside of the mouth and sending for genetic analysis. 
Um, and so there's a lot of hope for trying to figure out for example, a test where that we could run as a screening test before you had a heart attack to say if you're a woman and you know you have this particular test, whether you're prone to develop SCAD in the future. So that's kind of the goal. Instead of making the diagnosis after the heart attack, trying to prevent the heart attack from happening based on some type of test, whether it's blood test or um, some other type of, um, you know, material um, is our goal. The Mayo Clinic has made a lot of efforts to uh, work on some preventative work, and especially the exercise, and then the relationship to other conditions. So, for example, FMD has been, there's been a lot of questions about FMD, and we still don't know a lot about it. Uh, so there's lots to be done, uh, and we make a lot of efforts from our side to be part of these big studies and involve our patients in it as well. That sounds amazing. I will give everybody can you hear me? Hello, oh. can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'd like to ask, if you've had chemotherapy or radiotherapy that could have led to scarring of the heart muscle or any damage, could that give you a potential for an, for an MI? Uh, usually the chemotherapy uh, that leads to scarring of the muscle of the heart could give you a future heart failure. So it is just weakening of the heart muscle or what yeah. we call cardiomyopathy. Oh, yeah. Some radiation, especially the older radiation therapies uh, that used very, very high energy beams were known, are known to have caused damage to the vessels at the front of the heart. So yeah. it could precipitate early atherosclerosis or blockages in the arteries. By the first mechanism I showed you, it could lead to a heart attack. Some okay. chemotherapies as well, some specific chemotherapeutic agents have been associated with clot formation. And we wow. have seen some heart attacks that are, were related to clot formation based on the usage of these chemo medications. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's no other questions. Uh, I don't know if you have any closing remarks, Dr. Taliva. I've lost you on my screen here. <laughs> well, again, I'd like to uh, really thank you about the opportunity tonight. And um, just wanted to say that I'm actually leaving um, Winnipeg. I, I'm on my way to Atlanta, uh, moving to Emory University, where I'm going to be working on women's heart health. And uh, uh, even this session is from Montreal, it's not even from home because I'm on my way, but uh, there's someone to follow me and it's Dr. Shangbo Liu. So the SCAD clinic will continue um, and all the patients that are attending will continue. And I'm hoping to, to bring some innovation from Emory back home and, and continue on the collaboration. So again, uh, Keep up the good work and thanks for supporting the SCAD group and, and being part of their recovery because it's very important. Well, thank you. And we wish you all the best in your new uh, career that, as you move to Atlanta. So we will miss you in Winnipeg for sure. Thank um, you, everybody. <laughs> thanks for the, the presentation tonight and thanks for joining us. And hopefully you'll join us again on Thursday for our next bit talk with Dr. Heaven Blewett. She's going to be talking about SLAC. And so the interesting points of that. So thanks, everybody, and have a great night. Thanks, Dr. Kaliva.